Welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. I am, of course, the Backyard Professor. I am here to entertain you, or I mean, show you some great chess. <laughs> you know, the old historical games of chess are exquisitely fascinating to play through, simply because their style is so different than what we play today, and yet there is some astonishing genius and combinations and power in their play. In his, in Kasparov's book, My Great Predecessors, part one, this is the era of Steinitz, Lasker, Capablanca, and Alekin. Cap Capablanca and Alekin were later on. In the beginning, in the Steinitz era, the late 1800s, and then Lasker came on the scene after Steinitz, died, but uh, the I, I want to read this basic historic background to this game I'm about to show you that is really something else. <laughs> I love these old historical chess games, man. They are so fun, and sometimes hilariously funny from our perspective. Not in a judgmental way, just in the way they play, we just, we kind of shake our head and say, uh, no. <laughs> we don't do that now. In 1888, the rich Havana Chess Club with which Steinitz, now Wilhelm Steinitz, was declared the officially now, and this was post Morphy Anderson era, he was the officially first declared world chess champion. Okay? And uh, Kasparov goes in great detail through the, the historical setting, the games, the players, absolutely fantastic stuff. So in 1888, the rich Havana Chess Club, with which Steinitz had good relations, invited the champion to choose his most worthy op opponent and play him the next match for the world championship in Cuba, and Steinitz, of course, immediately agreed, and when he was asked who he wanted to pl have play him, he said, without hesitation, he said, Mikhail Ivanovich Chigorin. At that time, the great Russian master, Mikhail Chigorin, he lived from 1850 to 1908. He still had only a short service record, but he was the most difficult, the most dangerous opponent for the champion, Steinitz. In Vienna, 1882, he had drawn one and one with Steinitz. And in London, 1883, he had won both games against Steinitz. In addition, he spoke out as a fundamental critic and opponent of Steinitz, who in turn called him a genius of practical play, who regards it as his privilege at every convenient opportunity to challenge the principles of modern chess theory. Chigorin played a sharp, combinative style. He was a virtuoso of various gambits. The Evans Gambit back then, it was very popular because of Paul Morphy and Adolf Anderson, and Chigorin was a master of the Evans Gambit. And later, when a whole generation of followers of the new school came into the arena, he won fame as the last chess romantic. So, Mikhail Ivanovich learned chess at the age of 16, but he didn't play seriously until he was 24. In the well-known Dominique Café in St. Petersburg, for the sake of chess, he gave up his job. Whew! He's a lot more gutsy than I am. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and from 1876, he edited a couple of chess magazines. After winning matches against the leading Russian masters, he became the strongest player in Russia for 25 years. That's how prominent Chigorin is, and yet we seldom hear about him these days. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play one of his games here. He was distinguished by an amazingly vivid, but nevertheless unusual style of play. So the game I'm about to demonstrate to you of Chagorin, Chagorin is going to play the white pieces, a gentleman named E. Schiffers, who was no slouch 
is playing the black pieces. This is not just a Mamby Pamby game. And they play the Rui Lopez. So this will be fun to see the Rui Lopez played in uh, the late 1800s and see how these guys do this. So let's get on with showing you the game. It is a typical Rui Lopez. E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Bishop out, and Pawn says, make up your mind. Here, Shigorin takes the knight. Um, and usually, that's not the strongest way, but we are in the late 1800s. And so this is how they played the Rue of the Past. It's fun to see historically how the Rui Lopez has been played, which is quite instructive and fun from a historical perspective. And now Bishop c5, the development is pretty decent. He's going to support his center here, Shigorin is, and now Schiffers is bringing out his pieces, going to play the minor pieces, and of course he says, okay, decide, and he goes ahead and takes the knight. And the queen will respond by taking the bishop. So both sides are keeping active, even though technically this is the drier version, as Kosprov calls it, of the Rui Lopez. There's plenty of play here that Shigorin gives us, which is really fun to see. Knight e7, and now knight e2, and then he'll castle. So the development is occurring speedily. This is post uh, Morphy and Adolf Anderson, and and they have they have learned somewhat of how to the importance I should say of development and keeping your pieces active and so on and so forth. So it's kind of fun to to see how they do this. And now. Uh, Shigorin makes a move that gets him an exclamation point followed by the question mark. Intriguing, but not the best. And he pops up G4. So, with this announcement, now in, in this era, uh, well, their, their gambits, the Evans gambit, was always famous for, for attack. Shigorin was a combination player, and so he is announcing, basically, I'm going to come at your king side. He's announced, I'm attacking. So now he has to make sure his attack will prevail. Again, Schiffer's a very strong opponent. Notice he brings up his queen, which will connect his rooks. Yeah, and the bishop comes to e3. He still has the option to castle, which will connect his rooks. So they're doing, they're doing well. As far as that goes, bishop b4, check, and here is the first unusual move, and it's a Lulu. He puts the king to f7. <laughs> Kasparov says, well, this is really an unusual yet interesting way to prepare for an attack. Uh, and he does do it. No, he doesn't get castled, but he doesn't need to. Watch how he does this. How he plays this is really interesting. And now, of course, the rook, the rook is coming into play, so they're both not leaving any man behind. Yeah, we see that. The knight now has traveled all the way over to here because he wants to use that knight in the attack. So we know it's going to be a kingside attack. Queen e6, now that's a good centralization of the queen. Yeah, she's keeping her eye on the king. You notice the king, neither king, is all alone. Uh, like we've seen in some Grandmaster games before. Uh, they're, they're taking care of their king because they realize, okay, I have to attack that side, and Schiffers is smart enough to know, okay, he's going to attack my king side. I better keep pieces mobile and yet protecting the king. So they're both playing really well at this point. And now h4. Here comes the pawn storm. 
You remember Fisher's famous, he said, I used to, I used to throw the H-paw all the way up in the kingside attack and then just sack, 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 weaken the kingside and then sack, sack, sack. That appears to be what Chagorin's doing now. Uh, from the hypermodern era, which was just after this one, in the early 1900s, you know, uh, Nimzovich and Reddy, several of those guys, the theme is you, yeah, you can throw your pawns up there, but you need to make sure that the pieces are backing up the pawns. Don't just throw the pawns up there without some support. And that it looks real good for Shigorin at this point. He's definitely got the pieces there to support the pawn motions. And now he's going to come on the queen side. And that's the proper counter attack, the countermeasure for a king side attack, is you play on the other side and hope you can weather the storm. But he's got to hurry. He's got to really hurry. And then rook to g1, he's going to bring a rook into play and king to h8. Now, Hold on, i got to mark where I'm at so I don't miss it. If you're playing along in the game and you're not quite sure where to put your rooks, because there's a lot of choices of which place to put your rooks, it's always useful at some point in the game to put your rook across from the opponent's king. It doesn't matter if there are pieces and pawns in between your rook and king at the time. It doesn't matter. It's always useful to do that. Schiffers is aware of this and he immediately puts his king off that file. Before the thick and vigorous attack comes, and before the tactics are thrown at you, he says, no, I'm not even going to go there. Uh, you could end up losing a pawn because of the bad position of your king across from a rook. Uh, you could have a discovered check. You could lose a piece. Schiffers just avoids all that. So he's playing heads-up chess, is what I'm saying. And now, knight comes to f5. Here comes the cavalry. And then g6 will ask the knight, what are you going to do? Now where are you going to go? And here is a very interesting thing. He bumps the a3. So the theory, the theme is you take, I'll take. And that will basically eliminate any queenside play, but it does not eliminate Chigorin's kingside attack. So that's a really interesting move. Here, and bishop comes to d6. And now, the move of moves in this game. Can you see what you would do as white? you probably, realistically, would not do what Chagorin did. Not even close. That's what makes these old historic games so unique and interesting and fun to play through because Chagorin really does a wild move. King E2. He is... And it's real interesting because the sacrifice of the knight is such a modern look at this. I mean, that is, uh, that is something Kasparov himself would do. It is the manner which he sacrifices the knight by moving the king that was so startling and unique. Quite a unique preparation for the battle. Now Chagorin can go full blast. And you say, well, he's sacrificing the knight. Yeah, he is. Watch. It's real interesting how this works. He's... He's paradoxical in his thinking. Now, uh, Schiffers, this is the bad move. That's dubious. That's not how, what he should have done. But he did, so let's see what happens. G will take F5, and of course the queen now must bump back one. And... Bishop, now, here comes the attack, bishop h6. Now, you can understand he wants to seal the king in that corner. So that makes sense. But it's still kind of an intriguing move. 
and Kasparov talks about it a little bit. Not quite the, the regular way to do a kingside attack, but very interesting anyway. Rook's g8, and now the bishop goes to g5. He does not want to exchange the rooks because the open file is Chigorin's. Notice how he opened the file in order to get the attack. And he will maintain the theme of the open file to get to the opponent's king, a very modern uh, view, but it's the best way to get to the king. And he's backing up his pawns with the pieces. I mean, that's a great setup at that point, from that point of view. And now the rook will take it. And h will take it. So Chigorin closes off the g file and in turn opens up the h file. He still has an open file, he's just switched them, but the attack is still on. The pawns are thrusting forward, and they're backed up by the pieces. That is a great way to do this. No question about it. And now c5. He's, he's pulling the trigger a little late on this. He should have been trying to counterattack on the queen side even faster than he's done. And actually, that's a usual theme, isn't it? We, how many games have we seen where once the king side attack starts, the counterattack on the queen side is either too slow or it just fizzles out and they begin focusing on defense, which means they're giving up the initiative. And here, Chagorin has the initiative. And now rook goes to the file. Of course, rook h1. Absolutely. Now the knight will come to g8. And now here come the pawns, and they're backed up very well by the pieces. You can see that. So now he's beginning the cramp, which is always helpful on a king side attack. You either blow it open or you force the king to only one square and then checkmate him. So he's cramping the king here. He's, he's putting the pressure on. Bishop f8, rook h3, he's going to do a rook lift so that he can get his other rook into the game. You thought Chagorin left his other rook out. At this point, he's just trying to prepare for a battery. And he does use that other rook, which is exquisite. And now c4, he's finally getting to the point to where he can begin a counterattack on the queen side. Chagorin ignores that and puts the battery together. Fundamentally so. Yeah, that's the move. And now C takes D3. Now, here, Schiffer is not sitting too badly. It looks like, I mean, he's got the queen and the rook battery, and he's got the file and the pawn hitting the king, right? So it looks like he's going to get some good counterplay. However... Chagorin's sight of putting it on h3 to protect that pawn with the queen and the rook backup is really nice. So it prevents any more counterplay. So, I mean, it was a little bit, but it ended up fizzling, being a dud of a counterattack instead of a good thing for Schiffer. So he's going to... H6 is a very good defensive move. You know, I mean, that's about all he's got, but that's decent. How does Chagorin overcome this now? He simply pushes the pawn to G6. There's no point in attacking and taking H6. Keep the pawn roller moving forward. Break open the king is exactly what he's doing with the backup of the pieces. Very nice. A good illustration of that. And now F7. Just, he keeps marching those pawns all the way up. Now here the question is, Schiffer's played a huge blunder, and, and Kasparov has the variations. He, he just, they're quite extensive somewhat. But that is the blunder of the game. He shouldn't have done that. He could have hung on better. I'll just give you just briefly. 
He could have hung on better by bringing the queen to d4, believe it or not. And letting him take it and then take the queen, the pawn that queened with the king, and now he can hold his own. But he didn't do that. So that's the variation as far as I went with it at this as far as I'll go with it here anyway. So he does put the knight out here and that's just that didn't work. Rook takes eight six. Check. Open file work. File work to the attack. This is superb how he does this. He goes down the exchange, but that's not even the relevant point. Usually in a kingside attack, you're not worried as much if you're Alekin and Kasparov, <laughs> or Karpov, or Steinitz, or Chagorin, or any of the greats, it's not material consideration uh, that becomes the most critical part when you're doing a kingside attack. Usually, uh, as Vukovic has shown in his magnificent book, you just throw everything at it, and you... If you are the one doing the attacking, you have to prepare and be ready to lose everything you own except the game. And you win the game. So it doesn't matter if you lose an exchange or not. I mean, it does, but you need to plan ahead so that you don't stop short because you don't want to lose the exchange. Yes, you do want to lose the exchange here. And then he queens. See, there's the extra power of the push with the pawns. Now he's got an extra piece, a queen. Schiffers takes it with the rook. Not the, he can't with the bishop because the bishop's pinned. He takes it with the rook, and it's a beautiful tactic that he has here, pinning that bishop, but watch his other tactic, which is really cool. Now the queen takes the rook. And the knight goes to g8, and now, because he has the bishop pinned, with the pin, remember, you always attack the piece. So the piece is pinned, and now you attack and go check. And it was here that Schiffer resigned. So that is a fun little historical game between one of the former Russian great players, and he was the best in Russia for 25 years. And this was the challenger to Steinhead. So this is kind of fun to see the, the way the Rui Lopez was played. And the preparation, the most unusual and interesting king moves that Chagorin made in order to place his pieces on the proper side and in the proper manner, backing up the pawns, then pushing the pawns to get in there, and then using tactics and the pieces to get the game. That, that, that's fun stuff. Uh, Kasparov has a few of the early games. I had a chess book once that showed all of these early games. I, I mean, I've got several chess books, but... I'll have to look up some. They are quite fun. They're historically very interesting. And it's really fun to play through them to see how they played. So there is your chess game for the day. You guys have a fun day today. I hope you enjoyed the chess game. I personally really did. There's several earlier chess games that I might have to show you from Casper. No, I have not forgotten Bobby Fischer either. I, I will continue trying to put that back together uh, where I show you all of Bobby Fischer's games. Um, this COVID-19 just knocks me for a loop. Life is uh, really interesting right now. I'm doing a lot of my art because I don't have the time to do anything else by taking care of my wife, etc. But things are good. Things are on the upswing. I hope you are being good. I hope you're safe. I hope you're doing well and all that jazz. So in the meantime, remember, stay safe, have fun, be good, do happy, and be well. And make lots of money if you can. Uh, that's the tough one, right? Yeah. Okay. 
you guys. I will see you in the next Backyard Professor Chess video.